This conference will now be recorded. So today we are going to talk about ensemble learning. What is this ensemble learning? If you look, look at Kegel and this kind of competitions, most of the time you will see the top ones, the top models using some ensemble method. They generally like uh, outperform most other methods, machine learning methods. They all, most of the time they use some ensemble learning. You can see they are calling themselves the ensemble okay, here. They are probably using some uh, ensemble method. If you go to Kegel, you open up some competition and you see the ranking, the past competitions, the leaderboards, you will probably see that the top 10 are always using some ensemble uh, learning. And what is it, this ensemble learning? If you remember, we have this kind of trade-offs in many machine learning algorithms. We have this trade-off of variance bias trade-off. What does it mean? When we have, for example, let's take the decision tree. The decision tree does very well with the training data set. It does excellent, uh, some, it has some excellent results with the training set. But the more the training set accuracy is high, the more the testing set accuracy is low. This is the error, which is the opposite. So the more the, here the, on the training set, the more it, we have a small error, the higher it is on the testing set. So that's why we try like to make less complex model. For example, with the decision tree, we use what do we what do we use for the decision tree to make it uh, more generalized, more generalized and better? What do we use? Something, guys. Don't be like. Uh, afraid of making mistakes that's all right in decision trees what do we use like to make the model generalize better regularization parameters oh sorry what regularization i can't hear you your sound is not very clear we, we just limit the size of the tree do you remember guys we limit the size of the tree and we get like something if we go here the more the complexity is of course the smaller the tree the less complexity is so when we limit the size of the tree we don't get the highest accuracy on training because the size of the tree is limited we stopped at some level we are not uh, progressing but on the testing we uh, we are having something very similar we are somewhere in here the testing accuracy is very close to the training accuracy and we call that the variance, the, sorry, the variance bias trade-off. If we go for a high variance, we are getting some high accuracy on uh, the training, but the high variance means the accuracy of testing is low, and the error is high. And if we want a low, vari a low variance or a high bias, if we want a high bias, we get very bad accuracy on training, but we, we, because the variance uh, is low, the accuracy on training and testing is similar, but the high bias make it, it doesn't generalize very well. You can see the error is high here. So this is like a trade-off. If you want a more complex model, we get a high accuracy on training, but we, will, we might lose a little bit on testing on the testing set the one that we did, did not use to train and if you want them to be similar so we want both we want them to be similar and with very low error error rate so if we make it more complex we get one and we lose the generalization if we make it less complex we lose again on that uh, on the accuracy but we we make them like we make the model general, general, and uh, testing on uh, sorry, and accuracy on testing and training is uh, similar. Do you get this point? It's like a trade-off. 
what we get from one side, we can lose it from the other side. This and this is like happening in most algorithms. Most machine learning algorithms have this kind of problem. Give me like, a, yeah, like give me something. Do you understand what we are talking about? Some hint, guys. Please, uh, ML, Miriam, you are uh, generally active. Can you repeat the question, uh, Rida, please? Do you understand what is this, what I, I was explaining as the bias variance trade off? To be honest, no. <laughs> I that's fine that's thing. totally fine i need i need yeah. like just your uh no i know no. that's totally fine so let's take the example of a decision tree what do we use on the decision tree to make it generalizing better tell me the depth we control the, the depth. depth exactly the depth of yeah. the tree yeah if we want uh, if we make the depth of the tree of the tree to the maximum what will happen to the accuracy to the training set of the training set what will happen to it? No, it would decrease. Yeah. No, it, it will increase the accuracy, the accuracy of the training set. If we make the depth of the tree to the maximum, the accuracy of the training set will be at its maximum because yes. we are like uh, making the tree big and it yes. is like uh, training more, getting more rules on the training set. So it is doing well with the training set. Do you understand this part? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. But what is happening is because it's trying to like uh, understand or memorize everything on the training set, but it's but it's, it's accuracy on the testing set start decreasing. This is the error, which is the or more or less the opposite of the accuracy. So what we, is happening? We are getting excellent accuracy for the training set. But one of the testing set we are getting worse. So this is called a high variance. High variance. The difference between the training and testing is high. In, the, in terms of accuracy, uh, are you happy with this? Yes. And it is also a low bias because it fits very well the training set the accuracy its accuracy of the training set is high okay but this is with the with a high complexity with the, like a good depth of the tree but if we decrease the depth of the tree what is happening if we decrease the depth of the tree what is happening is low the model of the is accuracy. less complex yeah that we are losing the accuracy of the training set but we are generalizing better because the accuracy of the training set and the testing set is almost similar. And this is like a trade-off in any machine learning algorithm. It's like a, a slider, you know, this slider, like uh, something that you uh, control, and you try to find the best, the best trade-off. What you, you are going to put this slider here, 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 what do you think we should, we should put it here? Here? Tell me, guys. Should Sorry, Rita, what was the question? So we have uh, like a slider that we control mm -hmm. to, to control this bias various trade off. We want, yeah. we want the, the highest accuracy on the training set and the highest accuracy on the testing set. We want them similar, almost similar but with the highest accuracy possible or the, or the lowest error possible. So what do you think we should put our slider, our GD complexity slider here? Oh, no, it's something towards the uh, left. Here? Probably more. More. On the, Some, on the top here. of the tree. On the top yeah, of the yes, starting from there. Something yes. Something yeah. around here, yeah. Around here yeah. is really is, is good. So we got something similar without like uh, losing a lot of the accuracy of the training and testing. So this is probably the best I would say around this region. So, and so this is a trade-off 
what you gain on the training set, on the accuracy of the training set, you lose it on the testing set, and vice versa. If you want it, if you want them to be similar, you can you will lose your accuracy on the training set. So this is called the bias variance trade-off. And this is happening in any machine learning algorithm. Most of them. So what can, there is some secret recipes that can let us like have more flexibility on this trade-off. The, like the, the this curve that we that we saw becomes like better. So ensemble methods combine multiple methods to reduce this variance. It's like we will have a lot of variances and we divide them. And this can help us like, to reduce this variance without losing the, the bias, keeping a low bias and at the same time reducing this variance. It's a little bit like this. This thing will be a little bit like that. Will be a little bit better. And so we can have like a more complex model without losing a lot. So it makes the bias uh, variance trade-off more flexible. See, so this is the goal of the ensemble methods. So one of the, these ensembling methods, there are a few ensembling uh, techniques. There is one called the bagging, bootstrap aggregating, bagging. It was first introduced by Leo Bremer in 1994. So what it does, this method? It takes repeated bootstrap samples from, a training, from, from the training set D and construct L DI sets. So it takes the original like data set, training set, and generates others, other data sets from it. But like it, uh, it, it takes samples with repetition. So it, for example, we have n, or, or uh, I say n, uh, yeah, n samples inside. It takes randomly a subsample sample from this uh, data set with repetition. It doesn't care. It selects by chance one of them randomly, put it in the new data set, and keeps doing it. So we can have a repetition, yes or no? Yes. We can have a repetition. I will, so we have this is the origin of the data set. It has some samples. So we create n samples, many data sets, not only one, but many. But all of them will, for example, go here and take one of them randomly, anyone, select one of them, say this one. We put it in here. Again, the second one, we will go again and we pick another one say this one and we put it in here third one is called possibly this one we put it again fourth one can be again this one because it's randomly we always pick and we get put it in here and we do that this for all the data sets which are n n data sets so we we end up with n data sets derived from this data set what, for example, if we take this data set, what is the difference between this data set and this? What is going to be the difference? Tell me, please. Uh, we can find the double uh, uh, data. Sorry. Yeah, we will find double. So what mm -hmm. can happen? The, the, their size is similar, by the way. They have a similar size. And in some places, we will have duplicates, of course. We are going to have some dupl duplicates because we do things randomly. And when uh, we have a large data set, we always have uh, five uh, duplicates. So when we find duplicates, what, what, what will happen? Some will be missing. Some samples in here will not be in here. Sure. So this data set will be like a representation of this data set, but missing some, some samples. So it's just like a subset of this data set. A subset with some duplicated samples. So it's a subset and we do it n times. So we end up with n 
data sets that are a subset of this data set. Mm -hmm. So this is the first step of bagging. After, after this, what we do, we build n classifiers using the n constructed set. One clicks are classified for per data set. So we will have like n classifiers, not only one. So because we have n data sets, say 10 or whatever, n equals 10. So we end up with 10 classifiers. And these classifiers will be the same or different. Say we are using only decision trees. If we train our decision trees, one decision tree per data set. So will be our decision tree is the same or, or a little bit different? Little bit different. Of course, they will be a little bit different because they are using different data, mm -hmm. different data sets. So they will be a little bit different. And then when we train them, and the, they, pro, they produce like uh, when we use them, they produce a class. What we do, we aggregate the result, which is voting. So we, we will have, this is the data set. This is the original one. And we derive this data set. And for each one of them, we create a classifier, like a decision tree. This is in tree one. This is in tree two. This is in tree three and four. And we can have multiple. And how do we like derive our decision? Is taking a vote. If, for example, we have a sample, new sample N uh, or sample S1, we send it here to classify it. So this decision tree will classify it somewhere, say class one, A. This one say class B. This one say class A. This one also says class A. What we do is just the voting between them. And then we will have what class it will be? Hey. Yeah, it's so just a voting. We do a voting between them and we get the class A. So this is the bagging process, a simple process. But its effect is really uh, huge. So this is the definition of bootstrap sampling. Given a set D containing N training examples, create D star by drawing N examples at random with a replacement from D. This is what we are we were explaining. What we call bootstrapping. This is what I was drawing. So we have the original data. Say these are the classes of this data. So we create and uh, derive data sets. When we build the classifier per data set, and then we ensemble the classifiers. We, we aggregate, we aggregate them. So there is a lot of randomness inside the, these classifiers because these data sets are selected randomly. Uh, can you hear me, guys? I'm not. Uh... Do you hear yes, me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So this is some effect of the uh, bagging. Let's say we have this data set. How many features do we have here? Two. 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 How many classes? Two. 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 Yeah. What are our classes? Blue Four. and red. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, is my data normalized, do you think, here or not? That's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, is is my data it? normalized? Is my data normalized here or not? I think no. No, no. Why not? Yes. Yes, uh, because it's between one and... Uh, one and yeah, zero. They are, the scales are similar. Ah, yes, okay. The scales are similar, minus one, one, minus one, one. So, so we have, what are my classes here? Circle and uh, square. They are all, they are all circles and here. Yeah, they are all circles. Blue and red. Blue and red. Yeah, blue and red. They are and all red. circles. So we, we have like two classes, blue and red, and these are two features. So using a decision tree, we get something like that. This is the classifier built by the decision tree. Because the decision tree, like, divide the class or the features 
like by a straight like line. So this is what a decision tree can learn when we like we plot what we learned. So it's getting most things inside, but missing in the edges. This is what how decision tree works generally. You will get something like that. So this is how uh, do you understand it like this graph, guys? Mm, yeah. yeah. Are you happy with this? What how decision tree? Because like it has two features and it is dividing the space from in uh, the beginning in here and here and here and here so with two features and it is by the error. Sorry? Those spaces would they be considered like error? Yeah, this uh, we will have an error here, an error here, 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 like where uh, things are not uh, inside in the, the right set. in the right classification, right? Yes, this are like the errors are around like the edges, and this yeah. is like typical for decision tree how it uh, process things. So these are the errors here, here, this blue thing, and this red uh, thing. Because the decision tree like divide things by like straight line. If if you were to say like, and um, it's quite hard from a picture, but the percentage accuracy of this model would it be like ninety ninety five percent? It could be. It depends. Yeah, it, it's high, but it depends on how many like the samples you have in here. I see. Around 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 the edges. So the arrows are are going to be around you know, the edges, but it's probably going to be above ninety percent. Which is really good, right? Which is uh, generally good, but it depends also on the problem. Okay. On the use case. Yeah, on the business case, actually. So it's the, like how you can like translate this error into some money or some cost uh, in your uh, business. Sometimes if it is life, well, it's a high cost. We want to minimize it to zero. But if it yeah, is, yeah. for example, uh, yeah, some... Uh, I don't know, so like uh, how often you order a part or something like that. It can be like uh, less crucial. Yeah. So this is what a decision tree would get. Let's say now we are going to use bagging, 100 bag trees with the same, and bagging can be used with any model. You can combine any model, even like uh, different uh, models. So you can see that combining them, we are having something much better it's like it, it's becoming blurry the like around the the edge we have some errors like in here here but it is much better than the decision tree here it's clear errors but here it is better because we are combining multiple things like this but they are slightly different the second tree could be something like that the other one it will be general will be all slightly different. When we combine them, we will have like more edges because uh, each tree has different edges. So we will have like more edges around. And by voting, we will have something like that, which is much better. We will, we have a little bit of error here, here, slightly here, but so it's much less. Do you do you see it, guys? Can you see that? Yes, yeah. yeah. Perfect. So this is the bagging. So bagging reduces the variance by averaging. This averaging reduces the variance. And also it has little effect on bias. Which means it doesn't like improve the accuracy on training. It actually reduces it a little bit. It doesn't improve the accuracy of the training. But the accuracy on testing will be, which is the variance, will be very high, like uh, very high, which is a low variance. Which means that this graph that we saw in here will be something like this. It doesn't improve the bias. The bias will be still the same in here. And here, especially this, this will, will not like move a lot. But this one, the testing will be better. Will be something like that. It improves the difference between uh, the training and testing. The accuracy on training 
I test it. So it, it improves the variance, but not the, bi uh, the bias. The, the accuracy or training will be the same. So this is the effect of bagging. It makes something very generalizable. The model becomes more generalizing. So because it's this uh, technique, this bagging strategy, improves the variance, which makes the model more generalizing. So what kind of models are best to be used with bagging? What kind of models do we want to like, if we use a decision tree? Is it better to use a decision tree with uh, a high depth or a low depth? Or a low depth? When we use bagging, it is better to use a decision tree with a high depth or a low depth? Maybe low depth. Why? Why uh, low and why high? Because the, the low is uh, the error is uh, minimizing. Yeah, the, the error is minimized. We duplicate the data set. So if we use a low depth, each tree will have a low error. Will have a high accuracy, a low accuracy. Accuracy is low, but it generalizes better. Yes or no? A low depth accuracy will be low on training, but the generalization will be better. Do you agree with me, Najwa? Yeah. But, but what is bagging doing? What is it making things? What is I the think, goal of bagging? I, I think we better to use it with a higher depth since it's correct all the it's correct all the uh, it's like because when we have high high depth we have a uh, uh, high variance okay between the training and testing set so begging uh -huh. try to uh, begging try to uh how say to go over uh, this uh um, how, how to say that to overcome to this correct. problem yeah exactly which is true 100 percent correct what you said we okay. use begging preferably with a decision tree of, of many decision trees of a high depth. Because the accuracy will be high, which means the variance is high. But back in reduces the variance, which means we keep the accuracy more or less, but we make it, mm -hmm. we make uh, by averaging all the trees, we are making them more generalizing. So we can go with a high depth. Are you happy with this explanation, Najwa? Are you here? Hi. So yeah, we, we, we are going to use bagging with a high depth. There is another method that we are going to see next time, which is boosting, and it does the opposite. But for bagging, we, we want a model that is very good with accuracies on the training. And bagging make it more general. OK, so you understand the, this part, guys. You are happy with this. Now, okay, before moving to random forest, uh, do, I, are you happy with, uh, with bagging? And how it works, and when do we use it? So we use it only with decision tree, or with all the models? No, you can use it with any models, but it is very famous with decision trees because okay. decision trees have this big problem: they have a high accuracy on training, but they don't generalize well. They have a high variance, low bias. So okay. the bias is not a problem with decision trees. But the variance is very high. And this is why we combine them a lot with bagging. And the results are super good. Okay. Generally, the results are excellent when we combine decision trees with bagging. Decision trees on their own are just, I would call them an average classifier. They are not that so good. 
but when used in combination with bagging, they become like uh, on steroids. steroids. And boosting is the opposite. We are going to see that next time. With boosting, we use very small trees, and but we like try like to improve uh, the bites. And uh, this technique, boosting, we will find it a lot in Kegel. It's like the champion method of Kegel competitions. You know, one of the algorithms used in it is called XG Boost. If you have heard about it, so. A random forest. So we use in random forests, we use bagging to grow a forest of many trees. This is a tree. However, for each tree, we do not consider all the features. Instead, so this is an extra plus. So random forest is using decision trees to grow many trees and combining them, but it adds a twist. There is something that is added. At each level of the tree, we consider only M selected features, selected randomly, and find the best split, split on them. What does this mean? So let's say we have this data set that we have used in our previous course of decision, in decision trees. So we have here one decision tree. So how would this happen? If you remember it for decision trees, to pick, to pick tie, we considered all the features and we we picked the best one. Do you remember this? Yeah. Yeah. Remember this? Like we considered all the features. We uh, like computed some measure. The best feature that can discriminate based on the class that can divide the pure classes, pure like groups, and we picked them. But in, in the trees of the random forest, we don't consider them all. We take randomly 10%, generally 10% of them. So here we have six. We take uh, like uh, 0 0.6, which means, let's say we take we take two randomly, just for the simplicity of, of things. So we pick one or two of them, of the six, say this and this, sex and k, and we pick between them the best one. So what is happening here? Each tree will be more different than, 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 than another. Do you get this? Yeah. At each level, we select randomly like just two, for, say two, and we pick the best one of them. And the same thing when we go here, when we divide the tree, we go here and here. We also select uh, another two, those that we haven't used. And we do the same thing again, again with them. So each tree, we introduce more randomness to the trees. And the trees will be more different. Yes or no? Like this, we got a answer. little, like this, we got a little tree. No, we, we, we will have uh, large trees, doesn't matter. But we select, at each level, we select like say two, normally it's 10% uh, or more or less. Say we select, just for, as an example, we select two, and we pick one of them. Say in the, in let's, I will draw. Say in the first tree, we are going to select this two. Randomly, we pick you know, that we are going to consider only these two. And we find out that mask is the best one. So we build for the first tree, something like mask. Then we go again. So mask is selected for the first tree. We don't consider it anymore. Now we pick for this uh, other two. Mask, we already used it for this. So let's say we are picking ears and sex again, because sex haven't been used. So it's still a candidate. So we pick this two. So the best one say it's ears. So we go here and said ears. And we keep our division. So for this, we don't select ears, but so for this, ears hasn't been selected yet. So let's co continue. And so ears have been selected in here for this level. And we keep doing the same thing. The tree is not going to be small. Because uh, like when we select 10 per the two elements or 10%, 
we pick one of them, but we return what we haven't selected. What we haven't selected is going to still uh, play a role. It just means that we don't consider all at each level, we don't consider them all. We consider only a tiny fraction of them. But we again do the same like random selection for the level uh, for the next level, consider all of them again without those that have been used before. Are you happy with this, uh, Samir? Sure, sure. Guys, are you happy with this? Are you happy with this, guys? Please uh, tell me. So uh, that means we take the begging, uh, we, uh, we take two parts to, uh, like not to, uh, um, we don't, uh, we don't look for all the, the features, like we look only. Yeah, for each level, we don't look for, for them all, but we are, we are going to still use them, maybe possibly all. Huh? It's possible to use them all. It doesn't mean oh. that we don't use them. So it's like the there is a chance that we cannot use them all. For the level, for the level, we are not going to use them all. But after this, this level, we still consider them all and we keep growing. So uh, it is still possible to use them all until we reach uh, the maximum accuracy. Uh, Redan, mm -hmm. can we say that random forest is um... Um, a method or approach um, um, is a bagging method um, for um, high depth decision trees. Exactly, yes, that's it's like a special case of bagging when we use high depth de de decision trees, but we add this little twist where for each at each level we don't consider all the features, we consider only a fraction, but at, at the next level. We consider another fraction, not the same fraction. It could be uh, these two. At each level, we uh, we add this randomness. Why? Tell mm -hmm. me why we do that. Why do we do that? It... Feel free to make a mistake. It, it, this is how we learn here. Sorry, what was the question? Why do we consider only a tiny fraction of the, uh, the features at each level? Why do we do that? Tell me, guys, if you answer this, uh, I will uh, buy you a dinner in uh, some uh, in your, the, uh, the restaurant of your choice. <laughs> Tell me why. Normally, you should try, even if you make a mistake, you should try to get dinner at your restaurant. It's like uh, this is related to statistics, no? It's like when we try, I don't know, I'm just uh, saying, it's like when we compare between two, like the probability is higher than when we compare between the whole uh, features? Uh, not really. There is something related to it, but not really that. Okay. It's because there is a chance of getting the same tree again. Or very, when we, we are building multiple trees, tree one, tree two, if we keep just using bootstrapping, there is a chance that tree one and tree two will be very close to each other. What we want are trees that are not very little related, different trees. And by introducing this randomness, like at each level, considering only a small set of trees, then we are building trees that are highly uncorrelated, different trees. So if we are building 100 trees, they will be all different. But like I said before, there is a chance that our tree is using all the features because at each level, at each level, it's start trying to use only 10%. At the end, if we have only two features left, what, what is how going to happen? At the end, we'll say we, are, we, we use multiple levels. 
at the end, we have only two features left. What is going to happen? Here we have just two left, say ears and smoke. Are, are we going to consider both of them to take the best one or what we have? So we are, we are going to probably, uh, if you are to take in two features, we are probably going to consider them both and take the best one, depending on the variant of the algorithm you are using. But we are probably going to end up taking them both because we like now we don't have uh, any uh, like selection, any way to select only two features. We are going to select them both and take in the best one. For example, if, if it is the best in at the next level, if we don't have a 100% accuracy, we are going to pick smoke because it's the last one. Are, are you happy with this? It's just to explain that my trees can like still use all the features. It's just the order will be different for tree one and tree two. The order of the features will be different because it's randomly selecting, like considering a small subset of features at, at each level. So they can both use all of them, but at different orders because some features will not be considered at the same level. It's a, it's a simple uh, phenomenon of simple uh, twist in the algorithm. But since we are selecting randomly, okay, so we can select uh, uh, the same uh, features uh, twice. That means no, we can we, get... No, no, we don't no. select it twice unless it's certain certain. Oh. Okay. We can select it twice. For example, here, if we selected ears, mm -hmm. here we can still select it. If we select it, for, for example, we selected here ears and okay. here smoke. Okay. But here, we are not going to select ears anymore because we did it before. But here okay. it can occur again. I see, I see. So this is how the decision tree works. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Right? So we can like have a maximum tree using mm -hmm. all the features. But here, but tree one and tree two will have different orders. Because, the, uh, for example, here we considered sure. these two, for example, but here we didn't. We considered others. K, per Thai, for example, we considered only this. Okay? So it, the goal is to have highly uncorrelated trees. We want trees, tree one and tree two, to be very different. So that's why we introduced this randomness. And we are going to see why this randomness helps. Why it helps. And we can now, like we said before, we, because we are using bagging, we can grow the trees to their maximum and do not worry about overfitting. Do you agree with me here with this? Do you agree with this, guys? We can grow the trees to their maximum without worrying about overfitting. Yes. Um. Is it because we use in bagging? Um. Is that bagging. the yeah. Hi, yeah, yeah the high trees? Um. They have low bias but high variance. Yes. Perfectly. This is because of bagging. We got. We are going to use the maximum depth of the trees until we get one hundred percent accuracy, or we cannot no longer longer split. And of course, voting will help us to make the decision and to aggregate all of my trees. So, so what happens when we add a random feature selection per level, the trees becomes highly uncorrelated and shifts their perspective, their respective perspectives. You know how an analogy to this that I like to, uh, to use is my trees are taken like different, looking at different portion of the data set. And also, they are like training or learning from this data set in slightly different ways by adding this randomness on feature selection. Where we select the feature at each level, there is some randomness. It's like you are having some students inexperienced, you're giving them something to learn, some materials to learn, and they like learn them randomly. They don't learn them at the same order. But when you, so each student 
is looking at just the, at the an aspect of the story, but learning it in different ways, not the, like learning learning the story in uh, like a particular order. Each of them is learning it in in like a random order. So we have randomness and only a small portion of the story. And then we ask them. So in each student is not going to be very strong at uh, generalizing. But when we combine them all, we combine their uh, understandings with a voting mechanism, we get a like they, they are all subjective, these individuals they are all subjective, but combining them all will make this highly objective, like classifier, highly objective decision. Can you see it happens in real life? You have like multiple experiences. Our experiences are all like we have, we look only at uh, an aspect of what is happening in the world. And there is a randomness on how we are learning things. Each one of us is like learning things in a, in a random way, like the order of things, like of, of information are different for each one of us. So this we have, our experiences are highly subjective, each one of us. But when we try to group them all, we use some voting mechanisms in making the decision, we end up with a much more objective decision. And this is really happening in real life, in, in real data. In real data set, it's really amazing how uh, these random forests are working. They can really comp compete with the best algorithms with this mechanism. Getting some people who are not able to generalize well, they almost learn things by heart without uh, very intelligent learning, but combining them will make this highly objective classifier, much, a much better objective one. Do you see what I, what I mean here? It's a funny phenomenon happening in real life. A randomness and differences grouped together can make a much higher objective decisions. It's surprising, don't you think, guys, that this uh, democracy even works in data, in data sets and classifiers? T tell me your opinion. What do you think? Tell me, guys, about uh, what do you think about this? Tell me, tell me about your feeling. I want, I want to see at least if you are a little bit fascinated to understand uh, what to say after. It's like, uh, to be honest, I didn't expect that uh, choosing randomly data can give a better uh, result. I know, of course. It's like this democracy applied to data mm. and classifiers, yeah. classifiers that are not so good alone and very subjective. They do very well on what they, on the, their experience. They understand their experience very well, but they are not able to like uh, generalize their experience beyond their life. But when we combine them all with the voting mechanisms, the generalization is there. The objectivity is like, multiple multiple aggregated subjectivities and this is really fascinating guys in the, in the world of data it's a really fascinating phenomenon happening happen. are you happy um, with this guys mm -hmm. yeah uh, so does it mean that we we are aiming to improve the random forest is like the randomness of the forest. There, we are aiming to improve the decision trees by adding a randomness and uh, like uh, this this uh, grouping of multiple trees. The randomness is only to make highly uncorrelated trees to make all the trees more different. Mm -hmm. And the, we also grow the trees to their maximum. So the, these are highly specialized trees on, on what they are seeing. 
but they are not good beyond that. But when we group them together, we have this super strong classifier. Guys, if you are not fascinated, and this is my bet, it means that you didn't understand the, what is the phenomenon, what is happening in Rwanda forest and bagging. Like most people, you, you, you are free to not be fascinated. That's totally fine. But in general, if you are not fascinated by what is, ha by what is happening, it means you didn't understand it. So tell me, what, is, what, is, what are your feelings about this? Uh, to be honest, uh, I didn't understand. But that's uh, very fine. That's, that's totally fine. Guys, tell me. Smaye, Fazla, Najwa, tell me. Sabil, Mohammed, please tell me. How do you, uh, what are your feelings about this, this phenomenon happening? I'm not too sure either. I don't quite understand it. Okay. Let's simplify oh. it. Yes, Anwar, did you want Reda, to ju say something? Ju just one question. Can you re uh, return back to uh, previous slide? Uh, for random forest, we we use the same data. We don't uh, no, make bagging. like debugging. We just uh, no, no, make it's random. Bagging is applied. Ah, bagging, the bagging is applied. Apply. Also, yes. we, we 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 make a, a random choice for uh, for future. For features, yes. We, uh, we uh, there is like full bagging. The full bagging is applied. Plus. Uh, plus the. the... Ah, okay. So, but but uh, when we ha we make a, ra a random uh, decision tree, the the most most tree is uh, we we will get an error when we when we apply this uh, the, the the decision uh, yes. tree. Yes. Let's How say. Can... That's a, a good question. So, if we have a, a full decision, a normal decision tree, a normal decision tree like uh, C four point five. The standard one and we have one tree used for random forests which is generally which which one is going to be the best this one is probably not, not not necessarily but which one is probably going to be the better this one or this one one tree in the random forest and one tree in the decision tree which one is going tree. to in yes, the decision tree with c four five it's and it's not 100 percent the case but in most cases the decision tree yeah. is going to be better than one tree in the in the random forest. Yes. Why? Tell me why. Uh, be, because we use uh, we 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 we, uh, we make uh, the, our decision tree basing on uh, the data and the evolving data. It's, uh, it is using the the whole data that I said. The whole data, data, yes. Yeah. And. It doesn't have randomness. It's always it always pick the best feature at each level. Exactly. Yeah. Always take the picks the best feature according to, uh, to the measure, to the uh, information gain or uh, genie or whatever you are using. It always picks the best feature, the first best feature, then the second one, third one. Here we are not always picking the best feature. We are picking the best feature based on a random decision. We sub select some features and we pick the best one of them. So there is like less precision in this one. Yeah. This one is probably going to be better than one tree in the random forest because this one are a light tree, light trees, lighter. But they are all different. Tree one, tree two, tree three. They are all different. Tree n. These trees are all different than uh, than uh, each one of them. Yes or no? Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Why are they yeah. different? Tell me why are they different? Because we use a random selection. Yeah. First, we and have random data sets. Random data sets. Yeah, and the random future yeah. selection. Exactly. We have two differences. Oh, each okay, one so of them, hmm. yes, we, each one of them is using a different data set, slightly different, and 
the feature selection at each level of the tree are different. There is randomness. There is like uh, mm -hmm. the information gain measure. We are picking the best feature at each level, but randomly we pay. We are, we are sub selecting them randomly and then picking the best. But here we are picking the best without any random uh, thing. It's always oh, okay. the, at each level is the best. But here we are first picking a group randomly and selecting the best one of them. This is because we want all the trees to be different. We want the trees to be highly uncorrelated, to have different experiences, if you prefer to call it that way. Like they have, it's like individuals having different lives. And we are going to combine their judgments. So these trees are highly subjective, don't you think? These trees are very subjective. Yes or no? Tell me, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They are highly yeah. subjective. And their subjectivity will make their power. When we combine them all, they are all different. When we combine them, the results are excellent, are super good. And it happens in a lot, a lot of cases. Okay. In, it's in, like, like we scan it's like we scan all possible all possibility so we will get more uh, more experience and we will get more uh, precision it's because also the objective parts are always included in the trees more or less not in all the trees but in group of trees so each group of trees will share things that are like very objective that happens most of the time they will be shared among them and the subjective parts that doesn't happen, like this uh, overlearning happen because of things that doesn't happen all the time. They will be included in very few trees. And when we combine them, they like auto eliminate things that are not general. They will compensate. For example, if this tree learned in, uh, in some part of it, things that are not general, but the, 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 the things that don't happen across all the data but happened in just the data set that was selected in here but these trees didn't have this problem it didn't learn them because they don't have this part of the data so these trees will cancel this part of the tree that is not general it's like like fighting uh, this bias in the group so if we have a bias here this or the trees will try to eliminate it if we have a bias here, these other trees will eliminate it. It's really some phenomenon happening in, 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 in our, our lives as human beings. Do you see this phenomenon happening in human beings? It's, if one is wrong, others can correct it. Can correct him. If the other one is wrong, again, the others can correct him. It's a, a little bit the principle of democracy, close to it. It's like... It's like if we can see it, like we fight among ourselves to like uh, correct ourselves. Each one of us have tr the truth and some false uh, assumptions. And if we like group them all, we can like remove these false assumptions. Do you get what I mean, guys? Mm, okay. It's really fascinating. If you are not fascinated, it means that we are, you are missing something uh, in this uh, explanation. Is the principle of democracy working in uh, like real life? Tell me, guys, what do you think? Ahmed, what do you think? To be honest, I wasn't like fascinated. It means that either um, I don't understand it properly, oh, you or you broke my heart. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> um, I mean, I, I got what you were saying about the um, the random forest and everything, but it's just is I don't know. I I don't have any feeling to be honest. But uh, it's like in real life, what is happening is that we are combining multiple weak classifiers. They are do very well, high accuracy on testing, on training, sorry, but they are bad for in testing. 
just by voting, we are having a much higher accuracy on testing. Just by making them voting, they are all super bad uh, when it comes to testing, to, to the testing set. By just combining them and adding the voting mechanism, we have a classifier. And this is really, believe me, this classifier, the random forest, it can compete with the best classifiers out there. It's not just a small improvement. It really can compete with the best classifiers. It's not just, uh, and it, it happens in most cases, I would say, where the data sets are big. Um, what did you are say? You still, uh, yeah? Uh, you said we combine them and we 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 make a vote. By... Combining is just voting. We combine them by voting. The trees are still there. So each decision of any each tree. What do you mean by voting? It's like I didn't get this point. Okay. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> so we put all the these random trees. Okay. When we have a new sample, sample S, S1, we call it. And we send it across the trees. So each tree is going to make a decision. Yes. This one is going to say class uh, bad guys. So we have bad guys and good guys. Like in, if we take the Batman example, bad and good. So this one is saying bad. This one is saying bad. This one is saying good, good, bad, bad. So voting, we take the majority vote. Here it will be what? It will be, be bad or good with voting. Bad? Bad. Yes. yes. Bad. Okay. We have more bad than goods. So the trees are saying bad. Okay. And when we start testing, we see the, the improvement of accuracy on testing getting much and much higher to the point um, where it can compete with superstar algorithms like uh, the SVM with uh, the RBF camera. It can really compete with it. I see. So mm. that means when we have like small trees and even they are weak and by combining no, they them, are big trees. They it's are, like. Okay. These trees are, it, as, uh, are as big as this one, even bigger, because this one we limit it generally. These trees, we don't limit them. It's like uh, each tree uh, will give us a part of truth. Exactly. Yeah, selection. each tree have a part of yeah. truth, but all, not only that. The, the other trees can eliminate the falsehood of a particular tree. Hmm. So the other truths can eliminate the false good in some tree, in a particular tree. They can like fight against each other. And after this fight, if you can, uh, if you want to put it that way, we will eliminate a lot of the bad parts that, that are inside of each tree. So okay. each tree is uh, like a group of trees will fight what is bad in each tree. So they will fight between themselves to get a better accuracy on testing. And this okay. really, believe me, guys, they can like, they like compete with some models like the SVM with the RBF camera, which is considered as a super model. And they can really, in many cases, get close accuracy to it. Are you still unfascinated, Amal? Um, I think I started to be fascinated a little bit when I look at it that we, we just, <laughs> we have random trees. And then we we just combine them. So we, we, we you, you know um, we do the voting uh, by combine, voting, combining yeah. yes, and then they would just auto el eliminate each, like the bias among the uh, trees that we, uh, we 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 select in the random trees that we select in. Yes, exactly. And they, it would they give do. you yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, and it, the it, results it, are, are spectacular in many cases. Yes, yeah. So although we like our, our selection was really random. We having like a excellent like result at the end when they they just eliminate the bias. Exactly. And guys, in 90% of the data set I tried, I tried a lot of data sets in my work experience. In 90% of the cases, the random forest was always better. This combination was always better than this, than the regular decision chain. 90% or more. Of the cases, the only cases where decision decision keys were better are cases where the data set is very small, 
and when we like divide it, we get even smaller chunks. So that's all when I got like uh, lower results. But in most cases, like over 90% of the cases, the random forest was doing better than the decision trees. And it's like sometimes it's spectacular results. Yeah, sorry, Reda, can we compare it to um, natural selection in somehow, like somehow? Um, like when... I wouldn't, yes, uh, if we look at DNA and what, uh, what is going to stay, you can, you, yes? In some yes, aspect. like for example, like for humans, for human species, I mean, if, if someone like has heart disease, for example, they're not going to have children and it's going to be like, they will be in the sample, but it's just, it would like, this would be eliminated by time. I mean, it, it's just like, maybe it's related to it, but maybe it's irrelevant. It can be a little bit really, uh, related, but here we don't eliminate those that have uh, like the disease. What we want in the human selection, there is like the human selection, well, if I can say that, how people are like, uh, I don't want to go to this topic, but how people <laughs> yeah, like are naturally like, like attract. Yeah, well, uh, I can at least mention that how people like uh, are like attracted to each other based on the face. Some theories uh, say that uh, faces that don't, don't display certain diseases are more attractive. This I don't, I'm not sure about it, but some theories say that. So a person where you have like more symmetry on the face, that it don't show some diseases are like more attractive. And then you can like select them, have higher chances of being selected, like to eliminate certain part of their genome. But I wouldn't go that way. I don't even master these uh, topics. I would okay, yeah. to compare it. I would compare it to like uh, the voting mechanisms and our decisions. Say we are in a board of directors, each one of them, having their own experience. So they have an idea. Someone likes uh, like uh, present to them an idea. And this idea, each one of them is going to judge it if it is good or bad. So this is, these are the classes. Idea, good, idea, bad. And of course, each one of them have got some knowledge and an experience. So they will start judging the idea. Some will say it is a good idea. Some will say it is a bad idea. But all of them are biased in some way. But in many cases, allowing them to vote, and there is an aspect here that is very important, important. In the beginning, they need to vote without influencing each other. Because if they start influencing each other, they can like uh, other aspects, like someone who does got a strong personality will influence the decision more, and uh, having a strong personality doesn't mean you are right. So in many companies, I try like to let people who are, don't have like a strong personality talk first, because the guy who has got like a very strong personality will dominate them and they can like lose excellent ideas. So they try to like have like uh, some uh, expose, like present their ideas before someone influencing them. And from these ideas, all of them, what they are saying, aggregating them can lead to a better decision than one or what one is saying. Generally, in many companies, they present their ideas in writing, and then what they call the debrief, they can like uh, look at the different ideas and making a decision. This is like, I think, more comparable to this uh, phenomenon. Do you get this, guys? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So this is what is happening, and really, like in, uh, it's impressive in how when we apply it to like real world say, scenarios, uh, data sets, how we can see that the improvement is always all the time. And not just always all the time, they can compete with the superstar models. And there is another thing, another excellent outcome in here. So we said the trees become highly uncorrelated and shift their respective perspectives. So what are the high, uh, the hyper parameters to consider in decision trees and in random forests? In decision trees, what hyper parameters do we consider generally? Probably the number of decision trees. No, no, in, in the, the regular decision trees, not the random. Ah, uh, regular, sorry. The, um, it's what? The, the size? The size. Yeah. For, for the regular the decision tree. Yeah. The depth, exactly, is the depth. Mm -hmm. And for the random forest, 
what kind of uh, hyperparameter do we consider? The number of oh, this decision Exactly, trees. the number of the trees and the depth. Do we consider the depth or not? Um, yes, yes, probably yes. the number of features yes. of in each tree. Yeah. Yeah, but this one, yeah, this one is generally fixed. We fix it. Uh, there is like a magic number. Uh, like in uh, from research, we found a magic number, but work, um, works most of the time. But do we like fix the depth of the individual trees? Do we have to choose it? No. It's always the maximum. Yeah, the yeah. longest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we got rid of one one thing, because selecting the best depth is not always easy. You can see it's like a slider, and we don't know well what to put it. But now, now we don't have it anymore. The maximum depth, uh, like the depth of the trees, is the maximum for the forest. So yeah, we have only the number really of trees. Really. But what is good about the number of trees is that the higher we go, the better. More generally, when we go higher, it doesn't harm. Here it is. A random forest does not overfit as we add more trees. So we can add like, a, say, 100 and, or, or 1,000, and we are sure we are not going to overfit. The higher, the better. So it, generally, when we select 100, is generally good for most problems, at least in my experience. 100 trees is, is enough and good. So basically, we almost don't have any hyperparameter. Can you see that? We be, uh, like basically we don't we hardly have any hyperparameter to tune. For the SVM, what hyperparameter did we have? Tell me guys, for the SVM, what hyperparameter did, did we have? If you remember. We have C, C and W. And W are not the hyperparameters, but they are the parameters that we learn, the algorithm learns. It's the model, part of the model. But we have to fix C in the beginning. C, hmm. C and if we are using the, the RBF kernel, we fix also sigma. sigma. Yes, we have two hyperparameters, and they are a bit of a headache to fix in the beginning because they are not linear. Like we will pick in the best C. If we change a little bit sigma, the best C can be different. So that they are a bit of a headache to pick. For the KNN, what is the hyperparameter? K. K, yeah. But for the random forest, we barely have any hyperparameters. We have the number of trees. If we fix it at 100, it's enough most of the time. We don't have like to worry a lot about it. For KNN, we have to test many, many values of K. For decision tree, for uh, sorry, the SVM, we, if you remember, we have like a matrix of C and sigma, and we have to try them all. If you, we want to use it that way, we have to try, the, try them all. But for the random forest, we just pick a good number, and that's fine. That's all what we need. We barely have any hyper parameter to choose. So no, we no, no longer need the maximum tree size or the tree size, sorry, as a hyperparameter to tune. Instead, we have the number of trees, and the model does not overfit as we add more trees. Generally, the more the better. In practice, we fix the number of trees dependent on the cases, and the, the which are the number of samples and the number of parameters. It, we can see in many times 10, 50, or 100 as common numbers. Sometimes 1,000. Of course, the more trees you add, the slower the algorithms becomes. And each tree, generally, in practice, is going to end up with 70%. So each bootstrapping example or each like subset of the data set is going to end up with 70% of the training data. So just to uh, have a quick look again at them, they inherit many of the trees' attributes they had the categorical data naturally as you saw like uh, for the batman example it's not numbers they're categorical data and they handle, handle them naturally are not anti-hard problems which means they are quick 
and they don't have they, they are non-parametric, which means that uh, they don't have an assumption. Like linear regression have an assumption. It has an assumption that data are going to follow a linear representation. But random forests are able to generalize across multiple data sets that are not linear. They can be interpreted to some extent, but not as well as decision trees. They lose, we lose some inter interpretability because decision trees are very simple to interpret, to like understand just by if then else rules. Like they are more stable than decision trees. So if we change the data a little bit, a decision tree can change because like the next best feature can be different if we change a little bit the data, but not along the, around the forest. Around the forest, if we change the data a little bit, it's not going to change a lot. They can be very competitive with the best ML algorithms, like I said. They can be excellent, uh, excellent. And they can be considered as a worry-free method, a worry-free algorithm. You can always use them in the beginning to see, to like establish a baseline for your the performance of your classifier. Because you don't have to tune any hyperparameter. You can start by using a random forest, establish like some accuracy on testing, and use that as a baseline. All other methods that you're going to try needs to be better, at least better than the random forest. So you can establish them as a baseline and try to improve by using this trees or SVMs or whatever you are using. And they can be considered as a word for you and have relatively good performance. Next time, we are going to see boosting. Are you here happy with how the forest was, guys? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very happy? Or just a little bit? Just a little bit, ML? No, I think you made it clear. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> guys. Good. Perfect. So this is like what you need to, to, to take out of this random forest. It's just how this, uh, this crowd, the, the wisdom of the crowd, what we call the wisdom of the crowd. We have, you have multiple judgments but there is a wisdom in this uh, chaos. When we combine all of this chaos, we can have some wisdom there. Like this is what I would call the take, what you need to take from this uh, lesson. So thank you. Thank you.